All right, we just got another T770 into the shop that the customer picked up from the dealer because they couldn't fix it and they brought it to us. And I get it, I'm always the second choice because the dealer should be able to fix it, right? But when they can't fix it, or in this case, the customer just, it was there too long, his bill was getting too high, and he just felt like something wasn't right. So he needed a second opinion. So he put a stop work order on the machine and he picked it up and he brought it to us. So his two issues were, well, the main issue is here is his attachment, okay? This Bobcat attachment is a soil conditioner and it has uh, an angle operation and the, the arms on the front will raise up and down. But in order for that to happen, we have to electronically redivert the flow. And in order to energize those solenoids to redirect the flow to make this attachment work correctly, it has to come through a seven pin connection. And we're gonna look at this seven pin and, and we wanna understand how the seven pin works because the more you understand how that seven pin works, the more apt you are to be able to troubleshoot what the original problem is. The other problem is, is it had a code for um, foot throttle calibration that, that I guess the dealer said they couldn't calibrate for some reason, I'm not sure, but it, it sounds like they probably updated or reprogrammed the controllers. And when that happens, it throws in an automatic, you gotta recalibrate the foot throttle after doing a programming. And you don't have to do that with software or anything. You literally do that through the panel. So you go out there, three minutes later, I you know, calibrate the foot throttle. So I'm, I'm not sure why they had a problem calibrating. That's literally a 15 second job. So maybe they don't know how to do it or they couldn't, I, I, I don't know. It calibrated just fine. So what we wanna do is we just wanna focus on the seven pin and the CAN bus system and, and why this attachment was not working and why they were having such a hard time figuring it out. And I think we've talked about this before, but Bobcat uses a seven pin connector, okay? So coming out of this seven pin connector, we don't have analog. Like when we move one of the switches in the cap, in the cab, we're sending a digital signal out of this harness and it has to come to another computer on the Bobcat attachment. Now this is called an RACD or an ACD. So it's an auxiliary control unit, okay? Because we gotta have 12 volts into our solenoids back here on the back and that's how we direct our flow to be able to move this attachment. So our digital signal, think of it as ones and zeros. They come out here, the computer intercepts that message and it sends out the proper analog 12 volts to the solenoids to work it, okay? So one thing that happens a lot is the cord here on the attachment gets damaged and that's where our skid sync boxes come in, but that's gonna be on a different video. But we know that the attachment works because um, they've already tested it on other machines. So I know the problem is not from here to the RCD or the RACD or the coils. The attachment works fine. The, the, the problem is on the machine side. All right, so how this works is on this seven pin connector, we've got seven pins, of course, but the three larger pins is our power pins, right? We have to have 12 volts in ground. So we can check the pins. We know that we've got a ground, we've got battery voltage on one of the pins and on the other pin, we should also have battery voltage ignition on. So right now the ignition's off. So I don't have voltage except for on one pin. Oh. And now when we turn the machine on, we can see that we have voltage on two pins, so that pin and this pin both have voltage. So when we ignition on, we have to have power on both those and that's how we power our remote auxiliary control unit down here on the bottom. Now that's the problem with the machine. I already went in, I found the problem. It was a quick, easy fix. And now we've got the RACD powered up and it's working. Now our smaller pins here, we can also check because this is our CAN bus lines, okay? And our CAN bus, uses voltage and those two voltages should equal five volts. And, and sometimes we have a little anomalies, but what I'm looking for is that I've got two pins that are, you know, around two and a half volts um, because the, the sum of the two CAN wires should equal five volts. And so I can check my CAN wires and I know that I've got power on the two CAN wires. Now there's something else that we can do just to check that the whole rest of the system's working. We wanna make sure that the controllers are working, that the joysticks are working, that all the proper signals are coming out of our seven pin. All 
So what we're going to use is what we call a can sniffer. So we're going to hook up our can sniffing unit to the can bus. Now, the can highway is, is like a highway that goes all throughout the system. It's two wires and we could tap in anywhere in the can network and see the, um, the messages that we're about to look at, okay? So when we move a joystick, we send a message out there into the highway and it's intercepted by this controller because it has an identifier. You know, we've got multiple controllers on here, but only this controller is going to intercept that identifier and be able to take that information and energize the solenoids. It might make more sense when we look at it on the computer. All right, so on our screen here, you can see that we've, we've got the, um, the CAN messages coming into the system. And I don't know if you just heard that beep, but we saw all kinds of things light up here because we're in a sniffer mode. So whenever a new CAN message comes in, it's going to light up this, this orange color. Let, let's just go ahead and clear the CAN messages and look how fast those CAN messages come back into the system. We heard it beep again. So what we're, what, we're, what we're getting is a code in the system and that's how we're seeing what happens. So we're intercepting the CAN message. So Mike's gonna jump in the cab real quick and what he's gonna do is move um, the joystick. So I think we're gonna watch one of these lines and when he moves that joystick, let's see what lights up orange here. All right, so it's actually line 12 here. We can see our identifier. Let's just call this identifier Bob, okay? Everybody else in the system knows that Bob works for the auxiliary department and Bob has one job. All he does is monitor that paddle switch that Mike is moving. So Mike's moving the left paddle switch. So if we look over here, we can see our CAN message. So if you let off the paddle switch, you know, we, we can take this whole bits and bytes and we look at the one that is changing. Right here in the neutral position, we see 0x50. Okay, move it to the left. See our CAN message just changed to 0x8 Charlie. Okay, move it the opposite direction. And now we move to 0x14. So that's how the messages are going into the system. The identifier has one job, he has one place to go, and that's the auxiliary control unit. So that's how we intercept the CAN messages and we know that the information is making it all the way out to our seven pin, right? So we know there's nothing wrong with any of the controllers inside. We know there's nothing wrong with the CAN network. We know there's nothing wrong with the seven pin cable that's going back to the back of the machine. Everything's working properly. So in this case, what it was is it wasn't a CAN network failure, a controller failure, it was a power failure. And we'll jump in and I'll show you what I found. So I wanna check the fuse box, because remember when I said I turned the ignition on, I did not get my um, ignition power to the seven pin. So the first thing I did is we check our fuse, of course here, and we see that our ACD fuse is what I wanna check, and, and sure enough, it was blown, okay? So I was like, okay, well, blown fuse. Let's just see if that's the problem. But as soon as I put a fuse in it, it exploded like it was a, nice bright arc like it it popped the fuse instantly so when you have a fuse blow like that we know that that's a hard short to ground and what i mean by hard that's not like a rubbed wire or a bad connection that is a power wire touching ground okay and and from there it's kind of pretty easy to trace now i use my circuit tracer like this unit right here and it really helped. So what we did is we just plugged that into the side of the fuse that we know was shorted to ground and we used our circuit tracer to take us right to the short in the harness. And I don't know, it was, it was really easy to find using the circuit tracer. Now, the person who was working on it before us like, I think he was on the right track. Um, I don't even know if I can kind of get this on camera, but back in here, he was kind of, you can see those bare wires right up in here. He was cutting the harness apart up here, trying to find the short, when actually the short 
was way back here in the back of the engine compartment. And there we go. So it's a little further back. So what I do is I start looking for where the harness is touching something that's usually where they zip tie it to the frame. And there's multiple spots and it's, it's just really difficult to see up in here. Maybe, yeah, it's really hard to see. But you can kind of see where right there the harness is zip tied. And then further up, there's a black bracket right there. And it was loosely zip tied. And that allowed the harness to rub right into that bracket. And it was, it was very obvious. It was like, we didn't have to do a whole lot of testing. Once we run the circuit tracer through it, it took us right close to that spot. And then visually we could see that it was just rubbing right into the harness. So we pull it away from the uh, frame and our circuit tracer went to open circuit instead of short. So that told us right away that that's where our problem was. So now I just got to crawl in there and finish repairing the wiring harness, but that's our problem. So now we can hook it up and I tested it and everything works just fine now that we've got the, the short isolated. Now, the, this poor guy was nearly $2,000 into troubleshooting for a 15 minute fix. So like we, like I'm not even, I'm gonna fix the harness, you know, I'll probably have 45 minutes in this machine, but I'm not charging the guy because he was already charged nearly, I think $1,800, right? Nearly $2,000 and they still didn't fix the issue. Um, so this was a quick, simple, easy fix. Now, I wanna make something clear is that I'm not blaming the technician on this one. Um, I think it's more of a lack of leadership in my opinion. At some point, somebody in the leadership role, somebody should have intervened and found out what was taking so long and why would they even let the cusp without someone else coming in who was knowledgeable enough to do it. I think that the, the, the knowledge is gone on the management side. You know, they just have these people up there and they're khaki pants or whatever and, and, and they don't know anything about the machines. They hire some kid off the street, he rolls his toolbox in. Wow, nice toolbox. You must know how to fix equipment. Is that a fair analysis, Mike? You think so? Mike's standing behind us. I know, I know you can't see him, but, but, but Mike and I both have to, as good as our technicians are, we still have to watch because sometimes they get in a bind. I get in a bind. It's not always them coming to me or Mike asking, you know, for help or information. Sometimes Mike and I go to them to learn. It's a communication thing and learning from each other. So I think the problem is, is literally a lack of leadership and poor management in, in these dealerships. That's what it's coming down to. There's so much turnover rate, number one, because they treat the, the way the, the employees are treated. And, and that, that's a whole nother video in itself. Long story short, I'm on the technician side. I don't think he was given the tools, the training, and the support he needed to, to properly diagnose this machine. So that's what we're here for. Any questions on that, let us know. Thanks for watching.